whether it's the third or not, these apologies matter to Indians. Tonight, what will all the official federal government visits mean for Nunavut at the ballot box this fall? This could be a model that other communities across Canada could follow to lessen their dependence on diesel. How Indigenous communities in Quebec will benefit from being on the grid and off diesel. They're all doing amazing. To me, they're all winners already. All these youth are all winners already. And we take you to the Alberta Indigenous Games. Good evening, I'm Brittany Hobson. It is hard to mistake Iqaluit for Ottawa, but with the recent influx of federal cabinet ministers to Nunavut's cap capital, the two look a little more alike than usual. Our Kent, Kent Driscoll has been covering the visits and is trying to figure out what is political theatre and what is actual substance. In the last two weeks, five different members of the federal cabinet have all visited Iqaluit, each touting projects new and old. Bennett for Crown Indigenous Relations, Garneau for Transport, McKenna for Environment, and Wilkinson for Fisheries and Oceans. The Prime Minister, too. Iqaluit is a direct flight from Ottawa, and more than 95% of the government of Nunavut's funding comes from the Feds, making the government of Nunavut a pretty willing partner in making an announcement. And the consensus system means there are no party affiliations in the Territorial Legislative Assembly, so they'll never have to deal with a Premier aligned with the competition. But each visit is not the same. Some are announcements of new money, some are re-announcements of existing money, and some are to say sorry. Carolyn Bennett was here very recently to apologize for how Inuit were treated on Baffin Island between 1950 and 1975. That came with $20 million in funding for the Kikitani Inuit Association. They represent Inuit on Baffin Island. That was brand new money, not allocated in the last budget. This is the third federal apology to Nunavut Inuit this year. We asked Bennett if there were any more apologies planned. Until there's been an apology, it's not really a partnership anymore uh, because there's this un, un, uh, he, he, lack of healing or even possibility of healing if people haven't said they're sorry. QIA President PJ Akiyoko thinks an apology has value. Whether it's the third or not, these apologies matter to Indians. Garneau doubled up on his time in Nunavut, having two press conferences with multiple announcements. All of these come from money already promised, some with a few more specifics attached. How much federal attention is wanted? Trudeau summed it up himself when he was here to announce a large marine protection area and associated projects. First he was asked, why didn't he visit as much as Prime Minister Harper? Then he was asked if he was campaigning on the taxpayer's dime. Uh, like the fact that the first question criticized me for not coming up here enough, and now I'm getting criticized for coming up too often. Clearly, Harper and Trudeau are different. But both made visits to Nunavut a big part of their agenda. Both brought along cabinet ministers to announce new and old money. Both posed for photos and shook hands. Both were criticized for their approach. And as usual, Nunavut residents will have to decide at the ballot box. What is political theater and what has substance? Kent Driscoll, EBTN National News. Remote communities burn 90 million liters of diesel a year to power their lives. Today, the federal government made an announcement that should mitigate the use of diesel and the damage it does to the environment. Hydro Quebec will receive $11 million to improve infrastructure in 13 Indigenous communities in northern Quebec. The money will go towards smart grids, which will improve efficiency of diesel-powered grids, saving 7,500 tons of emissions over the next decade. Hydro-Quebec adds that the smart grids will also help transition remote communities to renewable energy sources, something they hope to achieve within the next 10 years. This could be a model that other communities across Canada could follow to lessen their dependence on diesel, which is a both a federal and a provincial priority allowing us to reduce our carbon footprint while improving air quality and reducing, importantly, health risks. Earlier this summer, the federal government passed key pieces of legislation, like the Indigenous Languages Act and new laws around child welfare. But another important change quietly came into effect. Two new laws that officially made the split of Indigenous affairs into two separate departments, Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs Canada, and Indigenous Services Canada are now governed by their own separate pieces of legislation. 
Naomi Metallic is a Mi'kmaq lawyer and the author of a new article for the Yellowhead Institute called Making the Most Out of Canada's New Department of Indigenous Services Act. She joins us now from Halifax. Naomi, thank you for joining us today. The Trudeau government announced two years ago it was splitting Indian affairs, and it did. What's the significance of this split now official, it now being official in law? Um, sure. So the, uh, the split the government said at the time was uh, to... Uh, you know, have uh, Indigenous services focus specifically on that and then have Crown Indigenous relations uh, more specifically look at reconciliation and negotiations. Um, and I had some thoughts about that at the time and wrote some stuff on that and it is in keeping with um, uh, implementing RCAP but I had been concerned at the time that it was a little bit uh, premature given that they hadn't brought in all the other steps that RCAP had called for. Uh, but what this does, the, there's this, these two new acts, um, and they sort of set uh, in place the legal functioning of uh, these new departments, which doesn't seem very exciting on the face of it, um, but it is replacing the old uh, Department of Indian Affairs Act, which had really nothing in it uh, about how the department's supposed to act and what it's supposed to do. And so what I wrote about was how these new acts actually are interesting because they um, do put in some language about how the department is supposed to act, what kind of services it's supposed to provide, which could be used by Indigenous people to push the government uh, in situations where it says it doesn't have an obligation to do something or, um, you know, things that I've seen certainly in my past legal practice, um, so it can be used to uh, hold the government more accountable. So there was this resistance to the split that you speak of, even though it was recommended by the 1996 Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. Because Indigenous peoples weren't consulted, what do you think? Is there any good in this split? Um, I mean, I think the split is just an administrative change, and if you're not doing all the other things that the RCAP had proposed, um, which had talked about creating a land uh, and treaties tribunal. Um, it also had talked about an act that recognized uh, uh, significant self-government powers and all kinds of stuff. So even RCAP said, if you're just going to do administrative changes, um, it's not enough. You need to do all those other pieces. But my greater point is that this act in law, to, uh, that's, uh, particularly with respect to the new Indigenous Services um, uh, Department, is helpful in some respects and can be used. And now finally, uh, with the federal election looming, what should people watch for on this front? Will a new government be able to undo the Liberal Party's changes? Well, governments can always uh, undo something in law unless it's in the Constitution. And, um, but laws are hard to undo. They're a lot harder to undo than policies, which is why I argue in the piece in Yellowhead uh, that this is an improvement because most of the things that INAC had always done had always been by policy and very little in law. And the problem with that is that government can uh, change things around a lot, um, whereas when you have things that are set out more directly in law, you can hold them to it in court or in negotiations in a little bit of a stronger way. So, um, and I don't think a government's going to necessarily want to go knock all these things down. It, you know, draws attention if they're going to repeal laws. So, it's stronger than it was before, and it will be harder for if we have a different government to, to, to take some of this stuff back. Okay, well that's all the time we have today. Thanks for your input, Naomi. Thank you. It was a whirlwind tour for the leaders of 31 universities and colleges. The group gathered in the Yukon to learn from the successes of Yukon College and to discuss how recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission can be implemented in higher learning institutes down south. Here's APTN's Chris McIntyre with the details. For seven days, presidents of 31 universities and colleges came to the Yukon to learn about how Yukon College does it. The college has been at the forefront in working in community engagement, indigenization and reconciliation. The first stop for the academic leaders began in Dawson City, where myths about the gold rush were explained. Dr. Karen Barnes, president of Yukon College. People came away with this really different understanding of the gold rush. That the gold rush wasn't just about a whole bunch of prospectors coming up to the Yukon, but it was about the impact it had on the people who lived here. 
And uh, I think that was pretty profound for them, but it was a great way to set the context for this week because that's what we're talking about really is how do we recover from that impact. In Whitehorse, the presidents learned about policy, governance, programs and research. Dr. Deborah Saussier is president of Vancouver Island University and a member of the Métis Nation of Alberta. She says that there is a need for more resources when it comes to advancing reconciliation in post-secondary education. So the work is huge and it's falling on a very few uh, uh, number of people who have limited resources to provide that piece. So if I were to make a pitch for something, it would be to get a few more people so that we could start to actually help people uh, change their curriculum, change their course content uh, uh, to do it because I know the goodwill is there. The idea of this tour is to get groups to ask questions like what would it take to create change in the views about Indigenous people and what challenges they might face. Denise Emiot is president of College and Institute Canada. Because we have two partner associations, both colleges, uh, Institutes Canada and Universities Canada, we're all committed to pursue this. So we will find opportunities uh, piggybacking on what we are currently doing or in fact going further with new initiatives. After Whitehorse, the academic leaders will head to Carcross to develop an action plan for their universities and colleges in the South. Chris McIntyre, APTN National News, Whitehorse. It's time now for a quick break, but first here is some of Friday's weather forecast. Here is Friday's weather forecast starting on the East Coast. 24 in Halifax, 25 in Fredericton. 19 in rain in Nain, 22 in Cartwright, 25 in Gasp, 24 in Saguenay. In Toronto, 26 in rain in Windsor, 27. 22 in Big Trout Lake and 24 in rain in Sioux Lookout. In Northern Manitoba, 9 in Churchill, 22 in Norway House. Sunny skies in Gimli and Winnipeg with a high of plus 29. In Saskatchewan, 26 in Regina, 21 in Swift Current, 17 in Rain in LaRange, and 23 in Buffalo Narrows. Welcome back. In British Columbia, a dying man is challenging the province's alcohol abstinence policy regarding liver transplants. He needs a transplant, but has been denied a spot on the waiting list because he hasn't been sober for six months. APTN's Lori Hamlin has the details. David Dennis has end-stage liver disease. He needs a transplant or will soon die. And although Dennis does have willing donors, he's not on the waiting list because he's only been sober for two months. But British Columbia's abstinence policy requires zero alcohol for six months. Actually, it a number of uh, donators who have stepped up who have the uh, universal blood type. Uh, but to my surprise, we haven't even done a test on what my blood type is. <laughs> they don't have it on file. So uh, the, the depths of, the depths of uh, just how silly this process has been is... Uh, reveals quite a bit about the bureaucracy of, of this uh, health care system here in Vancouver. Meet British Columbia's abstinence policy. Dennis has to wait until December, time he doesn't have. Dennis says the policy is a lethal form of racism against Indigenous people and filed a joint complaint at the BC Human Rights Tribunal along with the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. The question really is, is, about, is about trauma. How do you introduce that idea where you calculate somebody's trauma? Grand Chief Stuart Phillip is also calling for the abstinence policy to be removed and for Dennis to be placed on the transplant list. Phillip says intergenerational trauma from colonization must be taken into consideration. Is jeopardizing his chances of surviving Aboriginal people, Native people, Indigenous people historically have been acknowledged to have a greater issues with um, substance abuse and, and alcoholism and things of that nature and the sense is that uh, if the policy were applied to you know rigidly 
uh, we'd lose a lot of our people. Chief Philip had liver disease himself and underwent a transplant 23 years ago. He says he's hopeful BC will eventually do the right thing. You know, I'm optimistic that uh, something good will come out of this. Uh, first of all, you got to create the awareness. Dennis is no stranger to fighting the system. He's been an activist on the West Coast for many years. Dennis says he's staying positive, but if he doesn't win, he wants the battle to carry on. We're hoping that this case, you know, whether, you know, you know whether we're around or not, that, that it continues and it, it, uh, it helps marginalized people in the long run. BC Transplant Society and the liver transplant team at Vancouver Coastal Health are now reviewing Dennis's case. Lori Hamlin, APTN National News, Vancouver. The plants you breeze by on the trail may hold powerful remedies, but how do you tell them apart? We have an encore presentation now of a story filed by Charlotte Morg Jacobs. Earlier this summer, she went on the land in the Northwest Territories to learn how. Yeah. And birch leaf just by itself, just in a tea. You can mix it with Labrador tea. Yeah. For Lila Fraser Erasmus, her traditional knowledge is of no use unless it's passed on. The Dene have done it for, for centuries and we continue to do it today and so that's something that's really important for other people to understand. My father is from northern Alberta. From when she found herself uh, making her own creams and lotions, she decided to start her business, Naturally so Dene. Today, she's taking a group out <laughs> to share the medicinal and nutritional properties of plants along with the cultural teachings of Dene Day. And so you always want to take the, the ones on the end. You don't want to take the ones in the front. Her participants want to build bridges between their cultures and indigenous people. Like Lucero Hernandez, originally from Mexico, but now living in Yellowknife. You're my cousin. <laughs> For me, it's better pick up because you can to be in contact with the nature with the mosquitoes <laughs> and you can see the real plant and the real flower. Before this, Hernandez would go to the market for her medicines. The Labrador tea, uh, because uh, normally I was thinking we can use only the, the leaves for a tea, but you can use the flower too. We'll drop some tobacco as a, as a way to Even as they swat away mosquitoes, plants to close by provide natural bug repellent. Very good. Very but Fraser Erasmus teaches them more so than just how to properly and identify and, and, and prepare well. medicines. I always make sure that we have uh, the tobacco and I always make sure that we have the smudge because I really want people to experience that and to have that information. Jose Claremont works at the Francophone College in Yellowknife yeah. and she says she's excited to be learning about traditional culture. Yeah, so for me it's touching. It, it all makes sense, you know, it makes me understand and appreciate more. Everyone is going home armed with plants and understandings of how to use them. A lot of the plants that we talked about I see all the time, but I had no idea that, that some of them were edible. I will use the petals uh, for my cream um, for a tea. So you can just rub that on your skin, and uh, so that's all that natural sunscreen that comes off the poplar trees. For Fraser Erasmus, through medicine walks, she respects the land and teaches others to do the same. Mother Earth needs us. Yeah. She needs us to understand her. And so if we don't, then we'll continue to be destructive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're not, they say that we're, we're killing Mother Earth, but we're not killing Mother Earth because she's going to survive after we're gone. We're killing ourselves. Leave it out in the sun. You can only leave it. In the Charlotte Mark Jacobs, ABTN National News, Yellowknife River. The Alberta Indigenous Games kicked off in Edmonton this week. We'll meet some of the athletes after the break. Here's the rest of Friday's weather forecast picking back up in northern Alberta in Fort McMurray 24, 16 in Grand Prairie, 16 in rain in Calgary and Red Deer, in BC, 22 in Vancouver, 20 in Tofino, Smithers is a high of 22 in Fort Nelson 16, in the Yukon 14 in Mayo, Dawson, Beaver Creek and Whitehorse. In the NWT, 17 in Yellowknife, 16 in Wrigley, 
rain and eight in Colville Lake, eight in Fort McPherson, 13 in Chesterfield, rain and 10 in Arviat, in Clyde River, seven degrees, in Iqaluit, 16 and rain. Fifteen hundred athletes from across Alberta are competing in the 2019 Alberta Indigenous Games. The week-long competition features Indigenous youth 10 to 20 years of age in many different events. APTN's Chris Stewart was at the track and field event and brings us this. Set. Set. Track and field was on the slate at the Rolly Miles Athletic Grounds in Edmonton. Teams from all across Alberta were in the city to compete. Participants included members from the South, like the Kainai and Northern Alberta's Beaver First Nation. Heather Epsassen brought several athletes 600 kilometers to compete. I brought some youth from our community to play volleyball, senior girls volleyball, and senior boys basketball. And this young man, Spencer, for track, and DeAndre for track. Spencer Ducharme from Beaver First Nation competed in the 400 meters. While he didn't win, he says he is proud to represent his home. I seen it as a great opportunity when I was asked to compete for these guys. And, um, uh, you know, just being a kid that loves sports, I was more than happy to come, comp come compete for them. You know, not only is it a, um, a lot of fun, but it's a lot of fun representing the bands and, uh, you know, um, showing what these... Alberta Indigenous Games are about. There was one standout runner in the morning. 14-year-old Aiden Patterson dominated his heat in the 400-meter dash. On Monday, he posted an 11.46 100-meter time, a very impressive speed for a 14-year-old. Heather Obsassin says she is proud of the youth representing Beaver First Nation. They're all doing amazing. To me, they're all winners already. All these youth are all winners already. Events such as baseball, volleyball, archery, canoeing, and more continue until Saturday. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. When you think of penguins, this is probably what comes to mind. The emperor penguin is the tallest of all living penguin species. They can weigh anywhere from 50 to 100 pounds. But now, a fossil hunter has discovered a much larger penguin that once roamed the Earth. This is a mock-up of the flightless bird, and as you can see, it was large, over a whopping five feet tall and an estimated 175 pounds, pretty much the size of an adult human. This is, the discovery was made by scientists in New Zealand. They say it lived 56 to 66 million years ago, just after the dinosaurs died off. That is one large penguin. That's your news for this Thursday. Find more on our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Brittany Hobson. We leave you tonight with some stunning visuals from outside APTN studio in downtown Winnipeg. Have a great night, and I'll see you back here tomorrow.